Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 podcast where we get together every fortnight to talk about technology, business, and the humans in it. I'm your host, Ivan Stegic. In this episode of the podcast, I'll be talking to Charlene Yashuski, a creative force <laughs> who's an editor, producer, strategist, and delicious sweets maker. Charlene. Welcome to the podcast. Good morning. I'm laughing because of how you pronounce my name. I've never heard that one. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't remember how to pronounce it. I have to be honest. And so I try to do as much pronunciation lookup on the Google. And you will never get it. I promise well, you. I, I can get it if you tell me how. How do I say your last name? Um, it's pronounced Ya She Ski. Yeah, nobody ever gets my name. Don't feel bad about it. Um, my dad told me, I even found out that I was pronouncing it wrong from some old Russian woman in New York, actually. I used to say Yasheski or Yasheski. And I don't know how she saw my name on a credit card or something. She goes, no, your name, Jachevsky. You know, just like, <laughs> it was funny. So even I was pronouncing it wrong. So don't so worry about it's, it. So the S-Z I thought was an S-H sound. That's why I said it the way I did. Um, so... It's Russian? No, Polish. Pretty much anything with a ski is going to be Polish. Um, and the, but that whole bag of consonants thing, that's also shared by Russians. So, okay. and, and this was in a, I'm sorry, it wasn't Russian. It was in the Polish section of Brooklyn. That's right. See, I've only been out in New York a year and I'm forgetting everything already. <laughs> oh, well. But you're not, you're not from Brooklyn though, although uh, no. you're from Wisconsin, right? I am from Wisconsin, the land did, of cheese. The land of cheese. Where did you grow up? I grew up on the west side of Wisconsin um, in a town that sadly, um, its claim to fame is having the most bars on one street. That was actually in the Guinness World Book of Records, if that tells you anything about the culture of my hometown. Wow. What's the name of the hometown? <laughs> Should I say I'll never be allowed back? Um, I don't think... <laughs> say it. <laughs> La Crosse. It's La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's a beautiful town. It's right you know, nestled in some river, you know, valleys and it's gorgeous, but there's not a lot going on there. So that's why I got out. I have been to La Crosse, Wisconsin. I know it's about, you have to go down to Rochester and then go east. Correct. Yeah. Just stay on I-90 and then just hop off. Is the, is the, um, the most bars in La Crosse Guinness World of Records, when they write it out, is that, um, is the abbreviation for La Crosse LAX? Yes. Do you it know can't why? Be. Um, because it's a cross. You know? Okay. <laughs> it's sort of like, uh, the, the, the question is, why is Los Angeles abbreviated as LAX? Where does the X come from there? It makes no sense. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. So you grew up in Wisconsin, went to school in La Crosse. Um, went to school in Madison, actually. In Madison. Yeah. So wait, so you were born in La Crosse and moved to Madison? Oh, I'm sorry. You went to school. I thought you meant college. No. Oh. Um, yeah. Actually, I was born in a tiny town called Bluff Siding, and it's just what it sounds like. There's eight houses on the side of a hill and lots of bars. As well. It yeah, seems I, to I want to write a book, I think, about just how towns grow in Wisconsin, because it seems like people land and then bars happen. And then, <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's it's like probably first, true. It's probably true for every little town across the United right. States yeah. and, and grocery probably stores the world. And bars. Yeah. Right. Daytime, nighttime. So you went to Madison to go to um, college and you studied some sort of art is my guess. I, I, I st why, why would you think that? But it's true. I actually was <laughs> studying art and journalism and um, I went back and forth for many years because I love both. But then I got tired of being in college and I had to graduate. And so I had more credits in journalism. So that's what I got my degree in. Did you get directly into journalism as soon as you graduated or did you kind of take a um, no, because elsewhere. my family was very poor and had no money. And so I, you know, got through college on the graces of student loans. And honestly, I did not, journalism would not make enough money for me to be able to live on with all my student loans. So uh, I had been a lifelong geek. And then I happened to tumble into tech support when I got out of college. So you were on the phone with people calling in and you were helping them out. I was, phones. and I really liked it. Um, and I was really good at it too. Like I had the, I don't know what you call it, like the best record for first call solving of things. Oh yeah. So that was fun. But then they figured out that I could write and then they're like, oh, well, we need training manuals at, at the company I was working at. And so I did that. And then they started sending me all over the country 
doing training. Then this tells you how long ago this was. This is when uh, newspapers are switching over from uh, typesetting to computers. So the company I worked for was training people how to use computers to set up classified ads. Wow. So and was, was that also in Wisconsin? No, that was in Minneapolis. I moved to Minneapolis after college. Was that in the 90s? That was in the 90s. Yeah, I was just thinking. They sent me to the East Coast. I was in New York and Boston, and both places had Teamsters who were very unhappy about things changing. And they, were, they weren't they were hostile to me, but they were very unhappy. Oh, this is a fun story. There's this guy. What was his name? I think his name was Tony in Boston. And he kind of ended up being the protector for me and this other trainer that came. And he would like literally be the buffer between us. And I'd never been to the East Coast before. And you know, all those stories about Italians, you see on TV, the way they talk, you know, like yeah, this yeah, kind of yeah. thing. And I remember we were walking down the street and <laughs> we were literally, the guy was like a block away and he starts yelling at that, Hey, Tony, you look good. And then <laughs> I was like, you look good too. And then we just got walking. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a tangent, but it's so funny. Yeah. So you've been, you've been to Minneapolis, you've been to New York, you've been to Boston. I know you're in the Pacific Northwest now. Um, where else have you been? It sounds, fa- it sounds fascinating. I was in Minneapolis after college for about seven years. And as many do, I got really sick of the winters and I'd always wanted to check out the West Coast. An opportunity came from a friend of mine in college. So I went out to Arizona and I hated every second of it. And there were only three things I liked in Phoenix. I liked uh, the orange blossoms in the spring. I liked the sunsets. And I liked this little Jewish deli that had the best beef brisket I've ever had. And that includes New York. And that's wow. where I lived in New York. But wow. I got out of there. And then I went to San Francisco. And I was there for the internet boom and bust, Ouch. which was fun slash not fun. Yeah. And then, then I came back to Minneapolis for a few years. And then I went to New York because I always wanted to check out. I just, you know, some pl- people have a home base and then they just travel I just travel. I mean, I just move places. And because I think you can get to know them a lot better if you live there. And have you been using your journalism skills and your tech support skills and your writing skills the whole time? Or have you kind of changed that aspect? Um, I've used it and I've morphed it. When I got to Arizona, I ended up working doing PR. And that was interesting because I'm not really a PR writer. And I'm, I'm a very good, you know, technical writer, user guide writer, things that are very fact-based. And PR, as you know, needs more fluffing. And the woman who was my boss was fantastic. And she knew exactly how to work me. Everything I'd turn in, she's like, Charlene, it needs 30% more fluff. And then I would just add, you know, adjectives to it or whatever. And to me, it just seemed excessive. But she would always say, that's perfect. Perfect fluff. And then when I was in California, I did, did more tech writing and tech publications when I got to New York, I sort of morphed into content strategy, and I'm sure you, you know what that is, but content strategy is also different. This could turn into a, another giant story. Just what people call content strategy could be something as simple as sourcing articles. I had one gig. It was just sourcing articles for a pharma company on arthritis, and they called that content strategy. And then one mm-hmm. other gig was literally matching up uh, pieces of content in two Excel spreadsheets. That was their content strategy. So Mm. it's all different, but a lot of content strategy jobs tend to be in pharma, finance, and health, which, you know, isn't the most interesting stuff and can be sort of soul sucking when you're talking about pharma. And then I really missed writing. So then about when I met you, I came back to Minneapolis after my dad died. It was weird. It's like, I just said to myself, you know what, I'd like to do more writing. And then our mutual friend connected us. And then I got to do writing for you. So that was really fun. And it was technical in nature at the time as well. I remember you salivating at that idea. Yes, exactly. Like, it's, I, I'm not going to write, you know, books. I'm not going to write a, a cookbook or something. But I, technical writing, I love to, you know, dig my teeth into that. So, Did you grow up wanting to be a writer? I, I, <laughs> I had this funny dream that I was going to be like a journalist in like war-torn Beirut. I remember having that mm. thought. But again, after I got out of college, I'm like, there's, I can't, there's no way. I just had that, you know, specter of, of debt hanging over my head and I could just never even consider it. So I didn't do it. Well, that sounded really sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did let myself have one dream though. Um, after, you know, I finally did get my you know, student debt paid off after a while and I was doing all this content strategy. And then I had another technical writing project and I had a, a cushion of money and I thought, you know what? I want to edit books. I've never gotten to edit books, just pure editing, nothing else, no marketing, no nothing. And so I, and again, it magically happened. As soon as I had that 
thought I heard about this company on a podcast and I looked them up and I got hired to edit books. And that's been really nice. I gave myself that gift, but sadly that doesn't, editing doesn't pay very well either, but it's been really fun to do for the last couple of months. Why editing over writing? There's two ways I can describe it. The heady theory is, well, I really appreciate good writing and, and clear writing and, and brevity, but I, I realized the other day that there's, there's something weird about me. Okay, so you know what synesthesia is? Tell the audience. Okay, synesthesia is sort of like when your senses get crossed. Like, there are some people who can taste colors. They see that the, the, you're nodding. This is sound familiar? Um, they see the color red and it has a taste to them or numbers um, have a feeling. Um, or I am sound. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I am that way with writing. So if I read something and it's not written well, or there's a question that comes up that is not answered, it feels jagged to me. And it's like, it, it hurts me almost. And so as I edit things and smooth them out, like I said, it, it, that's just what happens. It feels smooth to me and I can relax. So it's like if normal people, if they read something bad, they just go on about their day. Me, it just bothers me so much that I have to write the person that wrote it. I'm like, do you realize that this word is incorrectly used? That, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm one of those people. But um, yeah, it feels good to edit. That, that's my main thing. But I also do appreciate, you know, well-written content and, and brevity. Brevity is, is full of wit, as they say. They, say. they do say that. So brevity and clarity is is hard, isn't it? Why is it so hard, do you think? It's really not hard, but you have to have an eye for it. Well, there's two problems. So we were talking about this. We started to talk about this. We were on the phone the other day. Brevity and clarity, a lot of times we just don't have time for it today, I think. There's, well, there's two reasons. It's maybe not valued, um, the editing to get things to be brief and clear. There's not time for it. Or people... The other problem is people maybe don't know what they're trying to say. If they haven't taken the time to figure out what they're trying to say, it's really hard to be brief about it. I think the best ideas are the briefest ones. If you really know what you're talking about, if really if, if everything you're trying to say is clear, I mean, to you, it's obvious to you, you can say it clearly, I think. Richard Feynman used to say that if you can't explain a concept to a child, you haven't understood the concept yet. Thank you for bringing up a physicist quote. He is like <laughs> one of the most entertaining people, regardless of anything else he's contributed to physics. And I highly recommend people read his books, by the way. I agree. He's, he's amazing and very interesting to read, especially what his ideas are and the way he explains things are just mind boggling. And so we kind oh, of... Can I say what, what you just said about technical things? Whenever I try to explain technical concepts, I think, how would I explain this to my mom? <laughs> because <laughs> she, she's not a child, but she is in the ways of technology. And I think if you can explain things so your mom can understand them, you're doing okay. I think you're right. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. Brevity and clarity are not the same though, right? I mean, no. if they were, Twitter wouldn't be as successful as it is. Or maybe it would be more successful. I don't know. Why do you think Twitter expanded from 140 to 260? Were there people complaining that they couldn't be concise enough? I don't know. I want to say it has to do with their business model. They could cram more links in that way? Maybe. Maybe. I remember there was a trend where people wanted to say more than 140 characters. And one of two things happened. You either wrote it out in a Word doc or somewhere else, and then you took a screenshot of it and you tweeted the screenshot. Or you started using a thread and you would comment on your yeah. own tweets to get a thread going. So maybe there was market demand. Maybe users mm -hmm. wanted it to be longer. I kind of miss the days where it was 140 characters and you couldn't. I know, me too. I was already a good writer, but that really made me focus on whatever it was that I wanted to say, even more than I did already. And I thought that was great. But I have to say, it, it also had a bad effect. I think it sort of destroyed my ability to do long form writing, <laughs> just because why should I do it in two pages if I can say it in, you know, 50 characters? What's harder for you, writing or editing? Writing, definitely. I think I'm a, I think I'm a good writer. I think I'm a fantastic editor. Do you edit your own work? Because isn't that really part of writing? It is. I do edit my own work. That said, I think 
everybody could benefit from an editor. I mean, I, like I said, I think I'm a great writer, but there are things that I'm not going to see in my own writing that someone else could improve upon. But I, I feel like I can get about 90% there. And then, you know, I could have someone else do the 10% polishing. I was talking about this with an editor friend of mine that it used to be we ha- in writing and in publishing, people had the editor. So they only had to get their quality up to about 50%. And then the editor would fix it. But now they've cut out the positions of editors, you know, in newspapers and such. And that's why you're seeing a lot more, well, and just blogs, nobody has an editor. And mm-hmm. most writers, they're not up to 80, 90%. They're still at 50%. And that's why there's, you know, a decline of good writing on, online. Why have they it. reduced the amount of editing? Money. I don't know. I, it, and also speed, I think. Um, it takes time to be like, okay, you need to write this. You need to send it to the editor and they need to clean it up and fact check it and blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, got to get it out. So it's just, they write it and they get it out. So speed of publishing is more important than the facts and tweaking the words so that they sound right. Yeah. In a lot of ways. I, I worked at a gig recently where the boss basically said, I care less about quality than impact. And the impact was done by driving traffic to the content. And that made me really sad. Who inspires you on the, on the flip side? Who inspires me? I hate that question because I don't have like one person that inspires me. I have a whole group of people that inspire me. And those are the creators, the people that can create something from nothing. I, I, I'm so inspired by them and I wish I could be them, but that's just not the way my brain works. My brain is the editor of anything. Like you can give me anything, anything and I will improve upon it. I will make it better. But it's really hard for me to come up with something from scratch. And I really wish I could do that in so many realms, but I just can't, but I'm good at what I do. So, you know, a lot of creators can't edit. So there you go. No, we need each other. it's a, yeah. it's a syner- synergy, isn't it? It is. And it's not just a synergy between writers and editors. It's everyone who's a part of the whole creative loop in this. Um, oh, 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 you just made me world. think of something. I have, yes. a, I have a book that I want to write and here's the concept. There are three kinds of people. There are people who create, there are people who curate, and there are people who appreciate. And I think I've covered everybody in the creative model that you just said, right? What do you think about that? I think that you probably have captured everyone. I think that some people will fall into more than one of those three categories. Maybe you're in a different category, a mix of categories, depending on the stage of life you're in. That's true, too. Like my kids, they are probably more appreciators than creators right now. I guess it depends on what you're doing. I guess it depends on what you're doing. Because they're creating during the day at school, but after school, they're appreciating YouTube videos. Oh, no. (laughs) You know, well, that could be a whole other podcast conversation. The advent of so many things to watch and listen to on the web have made us all the appreciators and the curators as opposed to the creators of things. So the I used theory- to be a lot more creative when I was younger. I mean, I had all kinds of crafty hobbies and whatnot, and I don't do any of that anymore. But again, that could be a stage of life thing where I'm just tired. <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of thought that we have the ability to either be a, cre- a creator or a consumer. For me personally, I want to be more on the creator side and not on the consumer side because that seems like it's more fulfilling. And I want my kids to be more on the creator side and less on the consumer Mm -hmm. side. And that's kind of a struggle, as you alluded to now, because of all of the media that exists. And so, you know, I I guess that maps to to two out of the three categories you mentioned. What do you mean by curate? So create's easy, right? That's make. Appreciate that's kind of consume, right? What do you mean by curate? Okay, so every person has sort of their area of expertise, right? And if you think about that as sort of a, even on Facebook, you're a curator. My friends know that I like anything about marshmallows, so they send me stuff about marshmallows. I curate an interest in marshmallows. I also tend to post a lot of things about art, I'll I'll post a lot of illustrators. I'm curating, you know, this subset of artists that I think other people might enjoy, right? And I think we all do that on the web. I mean, in that way, it's sort of a form of creation. I'm, I'm, you know, creating this set of things to present to other people. So Um, you're really editing, aren't you? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) 
you know, and I do that. I, uh, that's a thread that runs through my life too. I realized the other day, I, you know, how I move around a lot. I'm starting to think I might not like moving. I might like purging and editing my belongings. That was sort of a sad conclusion I came to the other day. <laughs> so because you move so much, you're actually editing your life as you move. Exactly. I edit, it, it, yeah, and I have this process I go through. Every time I think I'm going to move, well, I know exactly when to start going through my belongings and thinking, what can I sell right now? Because you have to have a lead time to get things sold. Well, you know, where am I going to live? Then I get to research all these places that I might get to live, and I get to research all these apartments, and I get to, that's something else I do. Yeah, I'm just, I'm ruined, I think. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you mentioned marshmallows. Now I know you you are a sugar pusher. I've seen you described as a sugar pusher online. You no, know, that is okay. So that 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 came from two places. Number one, um, I used to make and sell marshmallows, chocolate covered orange marshmallows, which were the shits. Um, I'm not doing that right now, but I should. And um, it was the name I came up with was fluff marshmallows. Um, but then I started writing and blogging about sweets, and I needed a good you know, domain name. And that's something else I do is collect domain names. Um, and I came up with sugar pusher, which of course I, I'm not big in the drug scene. I didn't know that booger sugar was another word for cocaine. So, you know, now people think, <laughs> I would, yeah, it was real unfortunate naming on my part, but, um, it's, I tell you what, I have a card that I wonder if I have any with me. Well, I can't show it on video. This is audio, but it says sugar pusher. And that is a hell of a lot more fun to hand out at networking events than a card that says, hi, I'm an, I'm a strategist and an editor, you know, and <laughs> of course you're they're like, what is this? And then, then we have a fun conversation about food and food is the great connector I've found at networking events. It always is. So why marshmallows? Cause they're awesome. And they're made by fairies. You're a fairy. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That I, that's a joke that I didn't connect. People always ask me, "How do you make marshmallows?" It just it seems so hard. And I'm just like, "Well, first you grind up some berries, and then no." Um, <laughs> here's the story of where that happened: is um, Russell Stover, you know that company, right? They make yes. candy, and they used to make these amazing um, orange marshmallow chocolate covered pumpkins for Halloween. And then one wait, year, wait, 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 orange what? marshmallow. Yep. Chocolate-covered pumpkins. Obviously, you're not in the know on the sweets community, so let me introduce you. And so, yeah, and if you go, and the, it, what's re, it's exploding now. Like the Easter aisle of candy now, it's like three aisles at the store of Russell Stover stuff. So this is a really bad time for me this, this time <laughs> of year. Um, I have to be very careful not to eat too much candy. Yeah, anyway, so um, the quality went down. And it was just really crappy. And I just like, I need marshmallows. And I think I had just gotten back from California and I was sort of decompressing from, you know, 80 hour work weeks of startup life. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to come up with a good marshmallow recipe myself. I'm going to do this. And I spent, you know, a couple of months in R and D and I came up with the perfect recipe. And then I'm like, well, this needs chocolate. So then I had to research the perfect chocolate with the perfect mouthfeel. And then I figured it out. And then, then I was, then I was bored actually, because <laughs> I came up with the perfect recipe and now I'm done, you know, but, and then people wanted me to sell them and I, I sold them online for a while. And then I sold them through some local coffee shops and people still stop me in Minneapolis. Cause that's where I was. And I was doing it. Like I did that in like 2009, I think. And one time I was home in 2013 and literally this woman yells at me from the other side of the coffee shop. You're the marshmallow lady. And she comes over <laughs> and she's like, are you still doing that? Can I have some? They're so good. And then I had to let her down easy. And yeah, let her down. So I think if you would like to do a service to humanity, you could open source your perfect marshmallow recipe. I could, but it's not just the recipe, Yvonne. It's also the ingredients. Well, you can open source that too. And the method and the YouTube, you do the That's YouTube true. video and That's you true. allow people all over the planet to make them in small coffee shops at high quality. And you know what? They're really easy to make. The hardest thing you need is patience for a uh, sugar temperature because sugar is very fickle and you need um, a standing mixer. But if you have those two, you can totally make marshmallows at home. I love marshmallows. Did I ever bring any in to 107 when I was in town? Did you I deprive know, you of that? I'm sad. I think you did. If oh. I remember correctly, they were perfectly cube. Yeah. Like they were really large cubes. Yes. They were unlike any marshmallow I'd ever seen. Yes. And I remember them being um, 
pure white. Yes. Right. And I, so. I do remember them being really good. Good. Yay. That's the thing. You, I, I don't think you used chocolate or orange. You know, I may not have. At the time. I may not have. You know, oh, you know what? No. Because my chocolate source uh, was no more. So I, I didn't think I had access to the chocolate. So I think I just did. I made you the mallows. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people, they're like, I don't like marshmallows. I'm like, have you ever had a homemade one? No. Okay, just wait. <laughs> you know, they give them one and then they totally change their mind. Do you have... A sugar Pusher, changing the minds of marshmallow haters one at a time. Sugarpusher.com. I don't know if I have that domain anymore. Let me see. Sugarpusher.com. Nope. Uh, an artist has it now. Well, it was yeah. a good name. That was a good name. Do you have any philosophy that you live by? I do. And it's my favorite one. It's a very good one. Are you ready? Go Leap and the net will appear. Wow. Isn't that fun? That's trust in humanity, isn't it? It is. But it's also trust in sort of, you know, the universe, life, the force, all of that stuff. Because people are shocked. They're like, like, how can you move someplace and not have a job? I'm like, I'll find one. It'll work out. I'll get an apartment. It'll all work out. And it always does. Why does it always work out? Because the universe is a loving place. I don't know. <laughs> is it maybe the attitude that you have? I'm sure that's part of it. And we can get in the whole discussion of, is it magic? Is it vibes I'm putting out? Is it the fact that it's just communication and I don't realize how connections are being made, you know? But I've had so many just sort of serendipitous things happen that it, there's got to be some magic in the universe. And I, I like that thought a lot better than thinking that there isn't. Would it be bad if there wasn't? It wouldn't be bad. It would just, I don't know. I, I just like the idea that, that there's some sort of like maybe mischievous fairy behind the scenes just waiting for me to ask it something to do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Rather than just, well, everything is just only what we make it and it, I don't know. I mean, there's still magic to be had in that for sure. Because think of all the wonderful things that people have created. And there's so much beauty and laughter and in the world that even if there isn't something working behind the scenes, it's, we still have a lot of beauty and magic in the world. What if the laws of physics are the beauty and the magic? Physics laws are beautiful and magical. Let's talk about that. Is that why you got into physics? Did you find magic in the, in the math and the physics and the science? I would love to say that I did, but um, I was standing in line to sign up for classes and I needed two majors and I liked physics, so I selected physics. Oh, no. <laughs> you just happened to be standing next to the physics table. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. You and then I realized, that. <laughs> well, and then I realized that, that physics ma major in college required a math major. And so then I had to take math as well. I'll tell you what, though. Okay. Did you have this issue also? When I was in high school, I got like C's in math because it just, I don't know, it didn't work for me. But then I, I loved astronomy. And when I got to college, I took astronomy and you needed to take calculus to go with it. And I, I'm like, shit, I'm not good at math, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then it totally worked, though. I got A's in calculus. You know why? Because it applied to something. It was working with something. Yeah, the application of math can very often help you understand it. That does yeah. that does make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just going back to what you said about there being magic and fairies. I don't know that there has to be someone behind the scenes. I think the the fact I didn't that say someone. Don't oh. you? Okay, I okay. So people, this is a whole other discussion, also. But I like the idea of the force. You know, there's just this energy. You could tap into it for good. You could tap into it for evil or not so good or selfish reasons. And it just serves whoever asks of it. And I, I don't know. That's the closest thing to sort of religion or God that I've sort of come to. Because I, I don't like the idea of there being a person up there judging me. And this has now become a religious conversation. Which you That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. What if there isn't a good and an evil what if what there is it, not? Yeah, there is no good and evil. I, I don't think there's good and evil. There's only perception, right? Like, what, what is, is it Shakespeare that said there is no good or bad, but thinking makes it so? He was a smart guy, too. He was a really smart guy. There's a lot of smart people. See, we don't need gods. 
But like, think about just gun control. I've had so many arguments with so many different kinds of people about gun control lately because there are gun lovers who think guns are the greatest thing since sliced bread. And there are people who think that guns are a tool of evil and destruction. And there are people in between that said, you know, I'm a gun owner and I like to shoot things. It's all in how it's perceived. And it's also how the tool is used too. I mean, obviously a tool, well, I had someone try to call a gun a tool the other day. And I'm like, how exactly is a gun a tool? Because I mean, I said, I can use the butt of it to hammer in a nail if I want to, but you know, how is it a tool otherwise? And what, what, what did that person say? Oh, it was a horrible answer. It was something like, well, if someone's breaking into my house, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving them an, a Southern accent. It's like, if someone's breaking into my house, I can use it as a tool to make them not want to come into my house. And I'm like, that's a deterrent. It's not a tool, but that's the way they thought of it. And, and I guess that that kind of perception is subjective and they yes. have the right to do that. I would look at it from a very factual, statistical point of view. To me, gun deaths are related to the, the amount and access to guns that exists. And if you look at the data from other countries, as soon as the access to guns has been reduced, so the deaths have gone down. It just seems to follow. It, so, it seems logical to, to you and I, but to gun lovers, that doesn't. Do you want to hear the best word I've heard for gun nuts? Okay. What is the best word? Amosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said that the other day. And I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> Emosexuals. <laughs> wow, I have not heard that. I know. <laughs> I, I'm, gonna, I'm on a one. I'm a one, one woman team to popularize that. No. I think you're. I think you're going to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been wonderful talking to you, Charlene. You too. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. It's really been a pleasure. We should do this again. We should totally do it again. Good luck on your podcast. Thank you. You can find Charlene on Twitter and Instagram. She's at the Redhead Said. That's the Redhead Said on Twitter and Instagram. You've been listening to the 107 podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love to hear from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thank you for listening. <laughs>